and the preferences I just changed were interface to the light, units and in increments to inches, size and letting to one, baseline shift to one, kerning tracking to five, and display performance Greek type below to zero, and then I slide vector graphics to high resolution, because if you get EPSs, they may look like they have a white box behind them when there is none. So in all versions of InDesign, setting that to high resolution will help show the transparency that's on an older EPS. And then a few other things I do under Window Workspace, I always start with the Typography Workspace, but since we're doing interactive, I'll be switching back and forth today. And in Paragraph Styles, I like to turn on in basic character formats, optical kerning. It's Adobe's visual kerning engine, which makes um, all of the letter spacing look much more even and more readable. And I do better hyphenation settings. I would never hyphenate a five letter word. Usually seven or eight is standard. And I don't want three letters before or after the hyphen. I just, I don't want two letters before or after the hyphen. So make sure it's at least three letters before you hyphenate and never do more than one hyphen in a row. So two lines won't hyphenate. And I wouldn't hyphenate a capitalized words or cross column or last word. But when I teach for the poster printers in um, Los Angeles or Las Vegas, they actually turn this off with no documents open. So if you're doing posters, postcards, flyers, hyphenation is rare. There's no need to assume you want it all. And the most important thing about all of this is make sure you have no documents open when you do it. Because if you're working on a document, most of the preferences only affect that one file. There are exceptions. If I do edit, spelling, dynamic spelling, that's a global setting. So it wouldn't matter if a document was open or not. It would always do the dynamic spelling. And I really hate with a passion. I'll whip up a quick document and show you this. Uh, if I place any photo... and go to my selection tool. Does that drive anybody nuts? Or are you used to it, the little circle in the center? You may not have that in CS5. No, I do. You do, okay. It's called the content grabber, and I find people are inadvertently going to move the photo, and it moves it out of the visible frame all the time. So I go to view extras, and I hide that content grabber. Because if I select the picture frame, I have blue handles, if I double click, I get the picture itself with orange handles. So just a double click goes back and forth between those two. And I find it's usually not helpful. It's usually getting in my way. So I turn it off right away. And it was view, extras, and high content grabber. And then two other really important settings. If I look at pages and I were to add a bunch of pages, I'll just insert 10. This gets pretty long. You have to scroll and you're wasting a lot of territory on the left and right. So I wish this was on by default, but on the panel menu for pages, view pages horizontally. So whether it's facing or not, they sort of cross and then down and you could fit a lot more in the panel. And that's global as well. So view pages horizontally. And it's actually saved with my workspace. So it's edited in the typography workspace right now. And I didn't mention that when I started the recording that I'm on typography. But I will switch to interactive for PDF and digital publishing to show the buttons and forms and other things we're going to do. And then if I go to window and bring up links, this is a really useful one that I think might have been added in CS4. I usually dock my links up here with pages, layers, and swatches because it can get kind of long, but I want to see the post-scaled resolution of my graphics. So in order to see that, I go to the Links panel menu, and I choose Panel Options, and there's a column that says Effective PPI. Once I've placed a high-res image, if I blow it up, I lose resolution. So I want to see that they're all hovering around 300 or 300 or greater. So when I hit OK on that, this one's 240. If I click here and use Command, Shift, or Control, Shift to scale the picture and frame down together, it's 378. Because I scaled it down, it improves the resolution. If I scale it up, the resolution suffers. So you can even sort by that category. 
they do have that in pre-flight, but it's helpful to see that all the time. And these are things I wish were on. Like, why don't we have red squiggles under our typos in Illustrator or Photoshop? I would pay extra for that in those. The web's littered with typos because we don't have the red squiggles and people forget to run spell check. So just some important things there. And I will close this up and hit don't save. And I've turned on a keyboard helper, so I hit command W to close the window. Um, that'll just be control W on Windows. And you'll see if I hit shift, it shows an arrow or option or alt shows this little alien symbol. And then you'll see that for command or control. I also don't love the start workspace. Usually I turn that off because I might want to have extra colors added to swatches with no documents open. So they're available in all documents. So back in Preferences, I forget whether, yeah, it's in General. You could turn off the Start Workspace, so it's more traditional like it was in CS5, CS6, and earlier versions. And I may have to quit for that to kick in. Nope, it kicked in right away. So now, if I wanted to go to Swatches, and do you guys have a Pantone color in your logo, or is it just CMYK for the logo, the little V? I think yeah. it's CMYK. Okay. Do you guys have a Pantone color for your logo? Can you name one? <laughs> All right. We'll go with one of my favorites. I'll go to Pantone Solid Coated, and I will do Reflex Blue. It's so difficult to print. <laughs> and you have to be careful, though. There's this new feature in the Creative Cloud called Creative Cloud Libraries. So when I added that, they have a checkbox, Add to CC Library which doesn't show up with no documents open, but I actually use CC libraries a lot, and I'll show you a little bit of how I use that. Are, are you using CC libraries yet? Unfortunately, I'm on an older operating system, so it doesn't support it. Oh, that's a bummer. Okay. You might be able to log into the website and still get some library assets, even if the panel doesn't work on the older operating system. Yeah, I think if you go to create.adobe.com, it logs you in and I can get to my assets. Just as a side note for all Creative Cloud applications, nope, that's Adobe Create Ma Magazine. Maybe it's creative. I'll find it. Actually, I can do it here. I can go to Adobe Creative Cloud, Assets and Files, and then View on the Web. So on my hard drive, I keep a folder called Creative Cloud Files. They give you 20 gigs of storage with your Creative Cloud membership. Every handout I write or work on is saved in there. As soon as I edit it, it's uploaded to Adobe server. I was rushing so much the other day to get home from work, get dinner made for the kids, get the babysitter ready to go out to dinner, that I left my laptop in the car overnight. I've never in my life mm. done that. It was on the floor. Even the babysitter took my car. She didn't notice it. Thank God it was there in the morning, but if it was stolen, my most important files are on Adobe servers, so I can get to them from anywhere, any computer anywhere in the world. I just log in with my Adobe ID and password. So it saved my bacon a few times when I've had hard drive crashes or you know just things that aren't working right. I keep a backup version of my assets here. Like when I'm doing demos at customer sites and their network isn't working well, I have backup disks. But this is, as long as you have access to the internet, I can get to it on my phone, which is really cool. So I come back here and I even do collaboration with the Creative Cloud. So I was working on an Adobe training at Adobe in San Jose a few weeks ago called Experience Day. It actually may be easier to see in my hard drive. I feel like I pay $10 for so many little subscriptions, I'm unwilling to buy Dropbox or pay for it every month. Like I pay for Netflix, I pay for Amazon Prime, I pay for Buffer app. There's all these little $10 things going everywhere. So instead of using a subscription-based file sharing service. With my Creative Cloud files, there's a folder called Experience Day Assets where I can just publicly share that, invite people to collaborate, or even make a public link where they can download files. So you just copy and paste a zip file to your hard drive. And the one we did was Photoshop Magic Zip. So here, I can share a public link to it, which is really cool. And that also exists here. There's Photoshop Magic Zip. I can send the link to someone and there's a public link so they can have access to my class files. We actually use that on the day of class. All the Adobe employees, I was doing one hour sessions on like cool things you could do in Photoshop for people who aren't on that team or people who wanted to see more of the product line and they just came in with their laptops, downloaded the assets and we were ready to go. So nobody had to log into a server or anything, it was just a public link, which is really cool. But let's get into the agenda. 
So, and I'll try one last link, creative.adobe.com. Yes, that logs you into your Creative Cloud. So as long as you're signed into Adobe's website, you can get access to that as well. So it just relinks back to adobe.com, but you should see my picture show up. And then I can access desktop downloads, mobile, um, my Adobe stock, library assets. So I have a few Creative Cloud libraries that I use for things. And actually, one of my most fun things to show is something that's on mobile that I'm going to open with. I'm going to see if on this Wi-Fi we can share my screen. I might not be able to here, so since you guys are in the room, I could just hold it up and show it. They need a special kind of um, Apple hub usually to recognize it. Reflector often works, but no, this network isn't allowing it. But what I can do, and I'll just turn the phone around and show you, and I have a handout that I can bring up on screen. This is my collection of Adobe apps. I have a whole iPhone screen of it, and there's one called Adobe Capture, where I can build a color palette. Usually I wear colorful outfits today, I'm just in black and white, so it's kind of boring. But at the top left, I'm going to hit colors, and here I could take a picture of something, like my iced tea or my fingernails, and build a color palette out of it. So I'm going to hit the plus sign, I'm going to give it access to my camera. Okay, go ahead. Ah, come on. There we go. Oh, it got the carpet. That's good enough. So it built this five color library that's available in any Creative Cloud application. So I will hit next. And I don't know if it can spell Magianos or if I can do that, but I'll try. <laughs> Magianos carpet. It got it. And then I keep a library called CC Assets and Files where most of my main assets go. Oh, it got my nails in there too, so my nail color did hit it. It snuck in right at the right time. So I'm hitting save color theme. I've done this all on my phone, but I could access it through a website. I could access it through CC libraries if we're on a newer operating system. So I added Pantone Reflex Blue with no documents open. I'm going to start by building a new document, and I'll use one of the newer presets for web and just do a standard 800 by 600. Fits nice in mobile, web, tablet screens, and I'll hit create. And then I'll close that warning. And here in CC Libraries, I may have to update the Creative Cloud because you can see there's a few other color themes like blue dress, highlighters. Yes, I'm enabling syncing. And then once it takes a look that syncing is working, then it'll go get it. So files, preferences, Creative Cloud, Files, it's on. So every now and then it just depends on the Wi-Fi. Okay, it's syncing. So once it syncs, it should update right there. We'll give it a few minutes, but it should, oh, there it is, Magiana's Carpet. It appeared in my Creative Cloud Libraries file. Mm -hmm. So very cool. <laughs> I do that all the time. I think I have some like pink shoes, minions, my 1960s dress, and I have image assets, and I can even make these public links to share with people. So you can make it from your Creative Cloud folder, or you can make it from a library. I work with a few shared libraries where we collaborate. Um, oh, my color library is gone, but this Experience Day assets, when there's people next to it, these are assets that many of the different instructors teaching in Adobe that day used. So the students would have access to it, all the instructors had access to it. When I add something here, everybody subscribed to it will see it in their library, which is really cool. So if I'm curious, I can grab Artwork 3, maybe the Illustrator instructor used that, pull it out on my page. And so I've got a vector that's placed. But I want to do a PDF form. Have you guys done any forms in InDesign? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, most people build it somewhere. Maybe it's Word, maybe it's Excel, and end up doing it in Acrobat. I'm going to do this form first, and it's a model release form. I was taking some pictures for a company I teach for in San Francisco, Academy X. VMA is actually a partner with them, so you guys mm -hmm. sell into their classes. So I've been working there the last few days, and instead of having this fixed where I'm just typing the information in every time, 
I do text boxes over the top and I'm just going to convert them to form fields. So if I select that, I can switch my workspace at the top right to interactive for PDF. And then in interactive for PDF, you get buttons and forms. And at the bottom right on buttons and forms, convert this to a button. And it can be a button or a text field or a signature field or a checkbox or a list box or a combo box. Um, well, technically, I want it to be a text field, but you have to make it a category button first in order for the fields to light up. So it's like an Acrobat when you create a new form. There's a button tool, but a whole variety of other tools. In order for it to know it's a, it's going to be a text field, you hit button first. Where would drop-downs fall into? They would be under list box. I don't think I ever use combo box. They used to call them something different, but one has to be expanded, and then you click the open list. The other one's technically a drop-down. I wish they named it drop-down, but I'll show you both. Yeah. But there are one or two things you still have to do in Acrobat after the fact. It won't do everything perfectly out of InDesign, but it saves you the hassle of constantly updating the master document and then doing all your fields in Acrobat. You can do both in InDesign. A lot of people don't know that. I know. I don't know if that was added in CS5 or CS6. So I may have to Google when they added the form features um, to see what it is. It's definitely in CC. So here, this will be a text field. We'll name it Photographer. And then you could do actions related to it. You could play a sound. You could jump to a page. You could clear the form. You could open a file. So you could build buttons that help them if they're just Adobe Reader users to do certain things. But I just want it to be a text field. And then I put a description in, which is when they mouse over it, what shows up. Type the photographer's name. And if you work for a government agency, this is required in the Section 508 laws that you have captions or readable text for the visually impaired so the computer can read the description to them. If you don't have a description, it just reads the field name, which may or may not be helpful. Um, but I'm going to just put a little bit more detail. Type the photographer's name. And then I could force it to be required. So they can't hit submit if you are going to electronic electronically submit it. In this case, we just want the employees at Academy X, when they have somebody come in to take pictures, be able to fill it out in Adobe Reader so I don't have to be the one who's editing or printing the form and they don't have to handwrite everything every time. And then you could set a font size, but I think it automatically uses Helvetica as its default font. We'll see that once it's created. And so often what I do when I'm finished with that, I'll just stretch it so it has a certain width and height. And I'll hold down Option or Alt and drag it down for the model name. And I'll sleep better if they all end in the same spot. <laughs> and then it's a button or form. It's a text field. We'll just name this model. And type the model's name. And then I'll keep going. The well, default uh, for oh yes for form fields yeah. yes and those are some of the things some options you can set up on the button itself but there's no alignment here you have to do that in Acrobat after the fact so an Acrobat professional you actually have to do that so model email. Type the model's email address. And they're pretty much always going to be at Academy X. And then this, I'm just going to convert to a button. And it will again be a text field. But in Acrobat, you could have it populate today's date with a little JavaScript. So when they open it, it automatically puts that in. And in Acrobat, you can also specify the format of the date. Do you spell out the month? Do you do just numbers? Do you do the European style? That sort of stuff. So, enter today's date. And this I won't make a field. Like if other companies were going to use it, I might want to do that. And just so I sleep tonight, <laughs> I like to adjust the spacing. Oops, I need shift, not command, between them. So under window, object, and layout, I often bring up the align panel. 
and I'll dock that down at the bottom right. And then in a line, I can distribute the spacing. So now I know they're perfectly, yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, I know, it drives me nuts when that kind of stuff doesn't work perfectly. And again, I might make sure they all exactly end at the same spot, but the green guides are letting me know. Everyone lit up when I hit that right margin. Uh, smart guides were added a few versions ago, so they give you rich cursors with um, arrows that indicate whether things are matching the width and the height and that sort of stuff. Can I ask about the date? Again, yes. Did that automatically populate the day's date? No, that was something I manually typed in in the text frame. So you could have placeholder text already there if you wanted to, but that's a good catch. I should remove it because I don't want it to start at October 3rd. That was two days ago. So. Yeah, <laughs> it looks close to a five. It's an American typewriter. The threes and fives are really close on that so, um, typeface. But if you were to do that, if it were up to automatically populate the date of the day that they open the document, mm -hmm. that would, is that... That you have to do in Acrobat. So you do it on with a JavaScript in the field itself. And I can show you where you put that in. You, you just copy and paste. It's like uh, date equals new dot date with parentheses. It's a simple code, um, but it's just something I copy and paste in the button itself or in the text field itself. So although they let you do form fields, they don't have all the forms functionality that Acrobat Professional has. So there's still some things I have to do after the fact, like setting the typeface or changing the alignment. If I want the date right aligned instead of left aligned, I have to do that in Acrobat Pro. And the most important final thing I have to do in Acrobat Pro is unlock the save button for people with Adobe Reader. Because if they only have Reader, they can fill it out and print it, but they can't save the changes unless we enable it. And InDesign doesn't let you enable it. You have to do that in Acrobat. So I'll do that when it's finished. And then I could create a digital signature field, but the way I sign forms is I actually take a picture of my signature, clean it up in Photoshop, and save it as PDF and make it a stamp. So it's as good as a fax machine, if not better. It's a physical signature, not using Acrobat mm -hmm. signatures. I've had companies balk at it before, like, no, we need a fax. We need an actual copy. I'm like, a scan is the same thing as a fax. And the quality is better. A photo is better than a fax. So you have to talk them into it, but it's admissible in court. It is my signature. It's an electronic copy of my signature. So um, sometimes I get pushed back on that. <laughs> All right, so I'll leave that empty. Um, under signed and I'll just show you how I stamp that but the dates probably going to be the same on everything if I copy a field for posing and photographs taken on date they might take them on one date and sign on a different day but I held down option or alt and I'm dragging this down to copy the date field if they're named all exactly the same just as date when you put it in one it should populate the other two or three and if there were a young model that were there, I may want to have a signature for them as well. And I added shift once I started dragging it to keep it straight. But it will always add a one or two or three. So if InDesign lets me keep these named exactly the same, date, date, and date, I should only need to enter it once. And I'll do a save as, and I'll add my initials. And then I'll do File, Export. And when I do the export, I don't use PDF or print. I use interactive <coughs> when I'm doing forms. It enables more of the form stuff. It enables even rollovers in Acrobat. You can do hover states like on a next area arrow or previous arrow if you're building multimedia content in Acrobat. Acrobat's so deep. People don't know half of what it can do uh, for a lot of things. Oh, you did? <laughs> That's good to hear. And then I usually start doing version numbers. Um, on a good day, I only get to version two or three, but I almost always find something I missed or a typo or something out of place. So I don't ever overwrite the PDF. I keep adding a number, so the highest number is the one that's final, or goes to the client, and then I just trash the rest of them. I find when I overwrote them all the time, I forgot whether I made the change. So the higher number just helped me have confidence that I've got the right file. And then when I do export to PDF interactive, one nice thing you could do if you were doing multimedia in InDesign is you could open it in full screen mode. And you could set up page transitions if you wanted to. This is a one page file, so I'm not gonna do that. 
and create tagged PDF gives it that accessibility so that the descriptions I typed in for the form fields can be read out loud by a screen reading program. And a little bit I'll try publish online with something that has more interactivity in it than just a PDF form. What's the structure for tapping? Basically when you do accessibility you have to provide document structure like this is the page, this is a headline, this is a photograph. So in that case it just builds the structure based on the stacking order of the objects or how they occur on the page. But there's a whole structure tab where you could say maybe if I did the date at the top right and it's a little low, um, go to date first then go to photographer. So you can reverse the order other than where they occur on the page. Like there's sometimes tab orders, they might go row or column, left or right, you might want to alter it. Oh, and I just need to do pages, not spreads. There's no raster images. This is a vector logo, so I shouldn't have to worry about compression. But normally I might set that to 150 pixels per inch. So it's a nice, smaller, but decently printable file. That's good enough for laser printer and inkjet printers. I may not need 300. And if it's going to be shared online or emailed to somebody, I don't want to have to send big files to them. So I don't like 72 because it just makes the images look like garbage, but if you have a lot of images, you may need to go lower than 150. <laughs> and then I won't put any security on it, but if it were um, super secret, for example, when I did the training at Adobe, I'm being paid through a third-party company, and they emailed me a PDF form for bank information. So I put a document password on it, and I called them and told them the password to open it. So if somebody intercepted the email, they still can't get into it unless they hack in, but that's a lot of work. So you could put an open password, or if it's protected content, you could restrict copy and paste. So when they highlight text or an image, they couldn't edit it in Photoshop or Illustrator or use edit, copy, and rip off your text. But I will hit export, and I deleted all my preferences for all my Adobe programs, so it would be like it was on your machine. This is new also with Acrobat DC, the document cloud. On my phone, again, and I wish Reflector was working, does anybody have an iPhone charging cable? There's another way to skin this cat. Oh, actually, I might have one in my bag. You can use QuickTime on the Mac to broadcast your screen. Yes, I do. So I don't need reflector, but let's see if I can just show this. I'm full of tricks. <laughs> so I will quit reflector. Oops, now it's syncing iTunes, and you can see the songs that I like. That's actually my six-year-old's playlist. <laughs> but let me find QuickTime. She loves Bon Appetit, which is inappropriate, but she has no idea what it is. She just calls it that song, I'm on the menu. <laughs> it needs to be kind application. Come here. There. And under File, I think it's New Screen Recording. And it will show my face in a second, which is terrifying. Come on. Oh, good, it didn't show my face. <laughs> All right. She loves Snoop Dogg too, because she likes the popping, clicking sounds. <coughs> Maybe it's New Movie Recording. Yes, there it is. All right, so now you can see my phone. Now there's my collection of Adobe apps in the background. And I mentioned that I have the folder on my hard drive that is my Creative Cloud files. So like, I keep my insurance documentation there and my social media links so I can access it from anywhere at any time. So when I come back to my phone, if I hit Creative Cloud, it shows me the same thing I saw on the website. So I'm working right now on some Academy X handouts, updating their InDesign content. Inside <laughs> here, there's a source file zip. There's InDesign files. It gives you a little info on them. I could download or preview them. There's all kinds of tools. I can share with someone, move them, copy them, make a public link so I have access to everything, which is really cool. And then when I did Capture earlier, Adobe Capture, and I made that color library just so it's in the recording, I hit the plus sign, I'll go to my camera, I'll take a picture of my purple cable, 
and I could freeze the picture. So these two purples are really close to one another, so I might try to drag one of them to a slightly different shade or pull this instead of the tan to a different shade of purple. And then I capture it, hit next, come on. Purple cable. And then it's going to CC assets and files and then I'll save it. That's correct. Save color theme. And there was um, what I was going to show in Acrobat that's new. So if I come back here, it's got easy file access. You could add comments on your mobile device if you want to. You can fill and sign forms. So Adobe partnered with EcoSign, so you could sign with your signature. You're probably doing that at a lot of restaurants. They don't make you sign a physical paper receipt anymore. You just sign with your finger on the iPad. So EcoSign does a lot of that. So I'm signing in to the Adobe service that comes with Adobe Reader DC. You don't even have to be a subscriber to have access to many of these tools. You can just create a free Adobe ID and password. And that actually brings me back to QuickTime. If I look at my Adobe screen back here, some of my most favorite applications are Photoshop Fix, Photoshop Mix. It has like liquify tools to make your arms skinny or remove wrinkles or blemishes or dark circles. You just need a free Adobe ID and password to get to those. So there's some really cool mobile apps, even if you aren't a CC subscriber, that you can use with their services or through the website. But I'm going to sign in with my Adobe ID and password, and I'll turn off keystrokes so you can't see my password. <laughs> and let's see if I remember my password. Sometimes I change it. Oh, good, that worked. All right, and we'll turn back on the keystrokes. So notice how the first three fields are red. Those are required fields. So it's ready to be filled out so I can make myself the photographer. And this is a little dangerous. In InDesign, I set up the font American Typewriter. It's actually okay. Since it didn't have American Typewriter, it uses the closest serif font it can, so it's using Times. But I may want to try to change it to Helvetica or Arial or something that's on every machine. Um, Adobe Reader and Acrobat actually load from a font resource folder with a collection of like symbols for radio buttons, Times, Helvetica, Arial, and Courier. So it doesn't matter whether they have it or not, those five typefaces are loaded automatically. Why but I, the they're coming from, yes, the application folder for Adobe Reader or for Acrobat. So as long as they have Adobe Reader or Ac Acrobat, they get those five. So you, you can't you can. You just have to make sure it gets embedded in the document. So if they're filling out form fields, you can put it in a text area outside to the right, maybe if it doesn't occur in the background, but I wanted American Typewriter in the form fields, but it's not used anywhere in the form itself. I just make sure there's a text field that touches the page edge so I can forcibly embed that font so they would see American Typewriter, even if they didn't own it. It's a little cheat I use to force fonts to embed. If you extend the box, just so you have a text field that touches the page edge, it allows you to embed the font. So that brings up a good point. If I go to File, Properties, and Fonts, it is embedded, but usually for forms they switch to a generic one, just to be safe. But I could switch it back since it's there with the form tools in Acrobat, not in InDesign. So those are a few of the edits I make. So it made it in, it's only subset because it's a true type font and you can't fully embed. So the risk with that is um, all the characters aren't there. Only the unique character used, the unique characters used are there. So to be safe, sometimes I'll type the whole alphabet upper or lowercase, all letters, numbers, and a bunch of symbols in that box along the edge of the page if it's true type. So that like 90% of the characters they might use are already in there, they're embedded. Because if you subset and I type my name Kelly, only K E L is used twice and Y, only four characters make it in there. That's why I like to see fully embedded and not subset. They don't give you an option when you export for interactive. They do give you an option to fully embed when you export for print. So I'm actually going to do that because that's an excellent point about fonts. If I come back to InDesign and I export again, but this time it's version 2. Instead of PDF Interactive, I'll do PDF for print and hit save. And I do want to view it when I'm finished. I do want bookmarks and hyperlinks that comes on automatically. And yes, include the appearance of interactive elements, 
but the interactivity may not work. So I might still need to do some finagling. And then in output, don't uh, convert to destination and don't include the profile. So if there's anything with a color profile applied, it's permanently applied. So the profiles add a little bit to the file size. But the most important thing is in advanced, set your subset fonts to 0%. If you subset 0% of the time, all fonts that are PostScript type 1 or PostScript open type will fully embed all characters, all letters, all numbers, regardless of how often they're used. Not one setting from Adobe fully embeds all the fonts. Everything subsets. And that can cause problems where I've seen they place the pages <coughs> back in InDesign, maybe for an ad in a magazine, and bullets might change to a hollow rectangle. So things that aren't letters or numbers, higher ASCII characters can switch. If you subset 0% of the time, when I hit export, this is the second model release form, but it's really not a fillable form. You have to use interactive to make that work. So would that embed that too? Yes. So if I go to properties here, fully embedded, fully embedded, fully embedded. As long as they have licensing, it will. And then I could copy and paste the form fields over. But they just don't let you do that in the interactive because subset is smaller. So for interactivity, they usually don't want the embedding. But this is something that I, um, PIA, GATF, um, all of them have been pushing Adobe, please tell everyone to fully embed their fonts for print. If they never touch it, it may be fine, but problems exist because people are only subsetting. And they're only subsetting because no Adobe setting out of the box fully embeds. So then subset 0%. Yeah, if you subset 0% of the time, you get fully embedded. This is a printer's dream. This is what you guys need to see to make sure the file doesn't drop characters or substitute characters. Not that subset won't work, it's just dangerous because there's a chance it could fail when you do electronic imposition or you place it into another document or you make an edit and then it reads the font and then it drops characters because maybe you're editing on Windows and it was built on Mac or you're editing on Mac and it was built on Windows. That happens all the time. Important note. <laughs> Are people chilly? Is it cold in here? It's a little chilly. Yeah, I just noticed I that. So <laughs> yeah. So I could come here. Um, and I'm only in Reader, so I can't really edit my forms here. So I'm going to quit, and I won't save any of my changes. And I'll show you the publish online in a bit. And the model release, those are both of the PDFs. I'll right-click it, open with the full version of Acrobat. But it's still a hack. Like, to get the font in, for forms, I really don't force third-party fonts. Subsetting is usually okay because it's a form, it's not really for prepress, it's distributed electronically. I don't want Acrobat Pro DC to open my PDFs by default because Reader launches faster and I want a closer experience to what the receiver is going to get. So I usually test my forms in Reader, test my documents in Reader to make sure I'm not getting extra tools or extra information that they won't have. So Reader is always my default. And they give you the same welcome screen, but let's see. I'm not signed in here. Oh, I am. Okay, so it detected me. Good. All right, so it's just checking that I'm logged in. And then this is the first one I did, version one. So if I go to prepare form, it already knows the form fields are there, and I get the Acrobat form buttons. But some of the things I often like to do is I can highlight these three fields, double click or right click on them. Double click might have deselected the first two. Usually, whatever is the primary field is in blue. And when I say the primary field or the key field, that means it will align to it. So, as an example, if I adjust this height of the blue one and I right click, I can set fields to the same size, the height, and they pick up that new size. But I'll undo that twice. These are all selected, so the darker blue is the key field. If I right click and go to properties, they're all text fields, but the names are different, the tooltips are different. But for appearance, I might want to make sure instead of using Times Roman, you use Helvetica. So these are the collection of five fonts 
that are built into Reader and built into Acrobat and built into your phones. If people want to fill out forms on their phones, they don't want to use whatever's built into Android or Apple's PDF Previewer. They want to download Adobe Reader for the phone and it gives them some interactivity. It gives them the ability to fill out forms. So you do need an app to get all the functionality on your phone. So I'll change that to Helvetica. I could set the size. I like that it's a fixed size because if you build a form in Acrobat, they usually go to auto, which scales the text as you type and just looks awful. So at it in design, it automatically sets a font size, which is nice. And then for position or options, that's where you could change the alignment. She mentioned left alignment is the default, and it is. But if I wanted to go to center or right for anything, I could do that under options. So more editability in Acrobat Pro once you're finished. But the most important thing, I'll check each field. This one is photographer. Type the photographer's name. It's got the tooltip. You could do this with the dialog open. Type the model email address. I didn't put in type today's date. And I'll copy it. And let's make sure that at the bottom, these two, yeah, they stay date. And when I added that description, it worked. So if I go to preview the form and I type 10, 5, 2017, it did it on all three. So as long as the field name's the same, I got the date to kick in on all three of them. All right. I noticed your names didn't get a space. Where did I not do that? Oh, my <laughs> file names. Models email. Yes. Model underscore email is not Well, if you're emailing anything, a space is replaced with three characters. It replaces it with percent 20. That's why you get a lot of numbers and percent signs in your file names. Three. Three characters. One space equals three characters. So I have a permanent habit of always doing underscore if it's going to be hosted on the web or sent as an email attachment. And if I do it for all files, I don't have to go back and rename them to prep them to go to my web page. That's what we always wanted to do. Yeah. No, going back to the day. Yeah. Like, spaces were a no-no. Way back in the early days. See them all the time. Yeah. But because you can add them, people do, yeah. but then they don't know why their file names change or they get chopped off or there's all these numbers and characters that they didn't type in there. It's because of spaces and non-web compliant characters. And you'll notice that it didn't pick up Helvetica there. So I'll <coughs> go back to edit my form do a select all. Ooh, interesting. I forgot that on this I'd actually built a hyperlink for academyx.com. So it's clickable to go to their website and that shows up in the form field area. But if I selected all of them, I can right click. I probably can't do it with that one. Let's try it again. I'm going to marquee select them all. Right click, properties, appearance, and it varied. I want to make sure they all use Helvetica. And I want to make sure they use the Helvetica above the line at the top. I don't want any of my versions of Helvetica. These are the ones that are built in for all the forms. They work on mobile. They work on desktop. They work in Adobe Reader. So I'm making sure I go above alphabetically to the very top of the list. And then the most important thing, if everything I've done here is OK, I can close form editing and then file save as other reader extended PDF, enable more tools. So people with Adobe Reader can save their changes. How long it took me to figure that out? I don't, do you know it's been there since Acrobat 7? Yeah. That's going to be the most frustrating thing for people who are trying to fill out forms. Absolutely. And, you know, get called. and there's no way in the export dialog to let InDesign do that. There should be a checkbox to let InDesign turn that on. I shouldn't have to do all these things after the fact. But the, new, the features are newer, the forms and button features. And I highly recommend, and I'll just choose this and come out of there for a second. You go to, uh, let's see our keystrokes off. Let me sign in again. Uh, Forums.adobe.com. As, as Adobe community professionals work across the country or across the world, Part of their responsibility to keep that title on their business card is monitoring the forums and answering so many questions a month. So you'll get feedback instantly from professionals, but if you start a comment like, why can't I make it read or enabled out of InDesign, the engineers also watch it too. So the more people that give feedback on it, the more it goes to their JDI list. Just do it. 
this doesn't need to be debated. We don't need to make room for this. Just make this feature because there's enough people that want it. So back in Acrobat, it's saying it's going to let you save form data. They can add comments. They can sign a digital signature field if I made that a digital signature field. I purposely didn't so I could show you how to stamp it with a signature. Um, and I will hit save now. But when you do this, it does lock down certain edits. So I almost always add dash D for distributed. So if I need to edit these form fields or go back and put the JavaScript in for the date, I need the original 01 document because some things are put on lockdown once it's distributed. So you really need two versions out there. Most likely I just make my edits in InDesign, recreate the form field, and then make it enabled again. So InDesign is now my master, but there's still little things like setting the font to Helvetica or um, changing the alignment or validation of forms, like with a JavaScript or even character limits. I'll have to double check if you could set that. Sometimes for first name field, I'll put like a 25 character limit and last name field like a 50 character limit. So I don't try to type everything in one box. Or maybe state, you put a two character limit, so they don't type the full name of the state. You just want the two letters for the state's initials. So I'll hit save. And now I'll quit Acrobat Pro. And I'll go to Adobe Reader, which should be the default. That's my distributed one. And just a little side note, does it drive any of you nuts that um, Acrobat always opens up to fit the width of the document instead of showing the whole thing? There's a preference for that. They thought people were using it for reading, but as a designer, I'm using it for proofing. I want to see my whole document. I don't have to have fit in window every time I open a file. So in Reader and in Acrobat Pro in the preferences, on Windows it's under Edit Preferences. On the Mac, it's Acrobat Preferences. You can change the zoom to fit page. And once I, it's for page display on the left, zoom fit page. Once I hit OK and quit Acrobat again, and then open that again, now it will open fit and window all the time. And as another note, I probably shouldn't have the date in there automatically. So I should pull that information before I distribute the form. But I can do that in Acrobat Pro and the date's accurate now. So I will be the photographer. The model will be Laura. You willing to be a model? I'm sure. <laughs> All right. And your email? Laura at VMA.BZ. Okay. And then the date is done, but let's imagine I'm Laura and I want to stamp this now. Under commenting, which they've moved a lot around in the new version of Acrobat, in the commenting tools there's a stamp tool and I created a category with my signature. And just to show you how I did that, I'll go to custom stamps and create and I will browse to a PDF. I don't know if I have any other signatures out there. Let's whip on up really quickly. You'll notice I do that on like tax forms and stuff, freelancer forms. It's embedded in there. I think mine is just called. It has to be a PDF to be on the stamp. Yeah. So out of Photoshop, I just save as a PDF. But here I have this PDF file, KFM signature. Transparent. It's actually just a picture I took of a sheet of paper on my phone, cleaned it up a little in Photoshop, and in Photoshop saved as a PDF. But in Photoshop, let's whip up a new one. And that'll be fine. Can you come here and sign it with the brush tool? Oh, on there? <laughs> yep. Really? It's going to be weird on the touchpad, but just pretend oh. you're registered. It doesn't matter. Just like this? Yeah. <laughs> so you have to click. Um, oh. There's a click at the bottom. So finger at the top, click at the bottom. At the same time? Yeah. Oh, for gosh. I know. That's I didn't never bring gonna my mouse happen. today. <laughs> it's not going to be pretty. That's all right. It can be anything. It looks artistic. That's yeah. artistic. Perfect. <laughs> I didn't get the space in between. No worries at all. It's like drawing with a brick but with an extra level of difficulty. <laughs> That's all right. The trickiest part about this, though, is I need to remove the white background because I don't want to cover up elements. I want it to be like a pen on paper. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you guys have ever used the Magic Eraser tool in Photoshop, but Magic Eraser is phenomenal. It's like the magic wand, but with one click it removes the background. 
So you don't have to name the layer, select anything. It's unbelievable. And then I'm going to uncheck contiguous so it'll get inside the loops of the characters. And I will go ahead and crop it down to the size because in Photoshop even empty space takes up file size. So I'll just make it a little tighter crop so it fits nicely on the stamp. And I'll do a save as, not Dignature. <laughs> Go to my desktop. I don't know if you noticed that because my keystrokes are off right now, but Command D on the Mac takes you to the desktop from any Mac program, which is pretty cool. And I'm just creating a messy desktop because I'm busy. <laughs> oh, and I forgot to save it as a PDF. So let me do save as again. And the type, Photoshop PDF. That's the one that we'll see. Good. Save. Okay. High quality print is fine because that'll give me decent resolution on it. Save PDF. Okay. And if you have earlier versions of Photoshop, I can't edit that PDF, but I'm on the latest, latest, so I should be fine. And then when I come back to Acrobat, I'll go to my desktop here. There's lower signature PDF. Double click it, hit OK, and I'll just put it in the Kelly category. So I can make my own category or I could put a signature category. There we go. And now on the stamp tool, I can sign everything you owe. No. Yeah, <laughs> That's why it's good that you're doing it here. Yeah, it doesn't look much like yeah. yours. So it's actually probably better. Probably argue that. There you go. And then I could do a quick click, but it's kind of big just from the screen size. So I can click and drag to estimate the size and it kind of constrains it. And then I can just pick it up and move it where it needs to go and scale it down a little bit more if I need to. Had what? I didn't realize I've tried to insert a signature on losses, you know, uh, contracts, and contracts. Yeah. And I didn't know that. It has to be a PDF. It could be any type of PDF. Put in TIFF or. Yeah. It goes in everything else. Yeah. Just open it and save it as PDF, and you'll be great. And so many people don't know about this. Like, people are still. I don't own a fax machine. I haven't owned one in years. I mean, my printer is a fax machine, but I don't have a home phone line. <laughs> like, so I don't want to fax it. I don't want to sign up to a web service to do it. Just stamp it. That should be submissible anywhere because it's an electronic version. So, and then I would do a save as. No. No, a lot, not a lot of people know this at all. No, I mean, oh. like my wife would certainly not know how to do that. Yeah, we'll send her the video. Yeah, we'll send her the video because it could work in Reader. I'm just in Reader. Yeah. As long as the commenting's enabled, you don't even need to own Acrobat Pro. You just need to get your signature as a PDF. So when so I, I have received the form that says I can insert your signature here, mm -hmm. is that can I click on it then I can find that in my signature? That's different. Acrobat digital signature fields work with a password and authentication that's tied to your username and account and ID. And it creates a, I think a P12 file or a PK something file that validates it with servers and other kinds of stuff. You can actually put a photo of your signature as the stamp, but again, most people don't know how to do that. And when you sign it digitally, there's no physical signature that exists. It's all a numeric key. It's all computer authenticated. It's not physically signed. So it's different, but you could make your signature replace the generic Acrobat logo there but they usually have like location it was signed, reason it was signed, date and time it was signed. And when you do a digital signature in Acrobat, not a stamp like I just did, when you do a digital signature, it can also lock down certain things. Like when I used to work uh, for an East Coast training company, my boss was Mr. Happy, Larry Happy, that was his real name. And when I requested vacation time, I would fill out a PDF form, request maybe 16 hours off, digitally sign it, and when I did that, it would lock down my fields so he couldn't change the number of hours. Then he would either approve or deny it, sign it, and then it would go to HR. And HR has a public key that validates that we were the two signers with just our Adobe ID and password. So digital signatures where it has a place to sign and you click and type stuff in is different than the stamp, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think 
Okay. It can get pretty deep. There's a lot of levels of it. There's certifying documents, documents like once they're signed, everything goes on lockdown so nobody can touch it. Yeah. This is a really cool thing that people don't know about, that it's been there for years and years. Yeah. It was that one little thing that was the hang up. And it's, those little things that'll get you. <laughs> You're like, I saw this somewhere. It should be able to be done. <laughs> and I'll hit save. All right, let's do some buttons. Are you ready? Why not? We're here. <laughs> Back to InDesign. I'm going to save and close the model release. So any other questions about forms? You said earlier how you had um, created the link like, URL. Mm -hmm. You did that in Yes. You want to see how I did that? So if I go back to InDesign, down here on the footer, I don't remember if I used a master page for this or not. I'll select, yeah, it's got dotted lines on it. I'll select academyx.com, and in the hyperlinks panel, I just copied and pasted that. Okay. And it validates the hyperlink. When I first did this on a bunch of documents, I accidentally had a space that I highlighted with the Academy X, and it gave me a red circle here instead of a green circle because it was a broken link. So as you create hyperlinks, it's out there actively checking it. And if I go back to Adobe Reader, and I move down there and click and allow it, it will take us to the website. And I also mentioned, let's see if my phone is still up. Yeah, back in QuickTime. It ties into Acrobat. There's my munchkins. Acrobat on my phone. So I can go to my documents. And yeah, I'm okay with all of that. So all the Creative Cloud stuff that I saw is here. So I can look at Creative Cloud files or recent documents that I opened with my Adobe ID and password. It may need to refresh or may not be on the network. And here, local documents, things that I've saved or things that I've worked on, Creative Cloud documents. So if you look right here and I want to have access to that form on my phone, yeah, it, it syncs. No, so I, I was saying with the, my operating system, I haven't stored anything on the cloud because it doesn't sync. Because the operating system so doesn't I, allow it. Yeah. So I just put the model release in my Creative Cloud files. It may take a moment to update, so let me see if I can go to Recent, Creative Cloud, and under M, it should appear. We'll see if and when it does. Model release, yay, that was super quick. Well, it's probably syncing as we speak. <laughs> so error opening document, but, oh, sorry, and you aren't seeing it on my screen. Here, in Creative Cloud, there's the model release I just popped over. So sometimes I have to double check whether or not the files are syncing. And it looks like it's up to date. Sometimes I quit the app on my phone. Or every app on my phone. Nope, nope. Step away. And then it may see it when it comes back here. But if I go to M's again, if it M. Yes, it was just syncing. So there I could see the red fields, fill it out, pass it on to somebody else, comment on my phone, all kinds of cool stuff. I mean, there's so much you can do with the Adobe apps. And this is just free Adobe Reader for the phone. So, pretty cool. Now, is that form a responsive design? Can you set it up so that it will fit the screen? Better? No, it's not. It's a PDF. So when I turn the phone sideways, yes, they can see a little bit better, but it's still an 8.5 by 11 page. Mm -hmm. HTML forms could be made responsive, yeah. but they don't lock in like the form field width or the height. They aren't very printable. So a lot of people still use PDF forms. There is a really cool website. This is not an Adobe thing called typeform.com, which does gorgeous responsible web, responsive web forms that are very cool. But it's, a, it's an online service, and it makes it look very mobile and app-like. It's called typeform.com. And they create buttons for you, and like they'll get your name when I type it in. And they'll say, hey, Kelly, good to meet you. What's your gender? And they'll do little stories. So it's all online, so it's all Yeah. 
that free? No, it's a subscription service, and they just kind of do demos here. I don't subscribe, but it's beautiful. I think they let you do a couple for free just to try out the service. Pretty much for free until you get really elaborate. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. Are you familiar <laughs> with um, Live Cycle? Yes. Live Cycle is Windows only and it's basically beyond Acrobat Forms. I don't teach it, Acrobat Forms does enough for me. So it's for large corporations, maybe a government agency that wants to create tons of PDF forms and do validated signatures and signature management and trust management. So life cycle is deep. It's not something I teach, though. All right, back to InDesign. So in InDesign, that's how I made the hyperlink. So on the master page, I just highlight the text, pop that in there. And actually, when you build it in my workspace, go to typography, it automatically builds a character style called hyperlink. So you can edit it with your brand identity. I didn't build that. As soon as you create a link, it, it does that. So if I go back to this 800 by 600 document I was creating, I'm going to go to layers, or actually I'll do the master page, and I'll create a global background color. Oh, Reflex Blue, one of my favorites. And I think it was 800 by 600. I'll sleep better if that's typed in. And then in layers, I'll make a new layer called background. And I'll drag it underneath. And did you guys know you could just take this dot and drag it down to move stuff on layers in Illustrator and in Design? So I'm going to lock that down so I don't inadvertently hit it. But if this were a presentation that I'm building, I often build a layer called multimedia because I may not want it in the printed version of the piece. So for my multimedia layer, I'm going to grab the type tool and I will go to glyphs and webdings or wingdings. It might be wingdings. It has arrows in it. Yeah, that's the one I want. So in wingdings, I want like the play arrow. The glyphs panel has a new bug where it's not scrolling in this version. And I keep thinking it's me, but sometimes I have to stretch the window. Am I missing the play buttons? Eh, we'll go with one of their arrows. I like the like um, tape deck recorder style play button. There it is. Come on, let me have it. There. That will be next page. I'll draw another text frame for previous page. And I'm just double clicking to insert these. And then once I've got two of these, I want to make sure I'm on the selection tool before I do type create outlines. Because if you do it on the text tool, it creates an anchored graphic. So it's inside the text frame still. So I made sure I switched to the selection tool before I did create outlines. And basically, I just use type to make my button. And let's blow that up 500%. I think that's big enough. I'll blow this one up 500%. Good. And then I will fill them with white. And I'll pop them in the corners. And then once they're in the corners, I can make them buttons. And if it was on the first page, for example, I wouldn't need a previous page. So I'll have to release that from the master to get to it. But if I go back to interactive for PDF, I can go back to buttons and forms. I can make a new button and the name will be previous. On release or tap, do this, go to previous page. And then, if I scoot over here, grab that one, hit make it a new button. This will be next on release or tap. Go to next page. And by the way, these things at the top work in PDFs. These only work in Swift, Flash, or EPUB. 
which people are moving away from flash, so I don't use a lot of those. And then these are PDF only. These work in both, flash, EPUB, PDF only. So they have categories, that's what the gray is. And ideally, I might want a description, go to next page, and I could make it printable or non-printable if it's part of the layout, but the action, go to next page, and beyond that, I can add a rollover. So if I hit rollover in swatches, let's make it do yellow. And then I'll scoot over to this one, select it, go to previous page. And then hit rollover. And it's interactivity. So I'll show you. If I preview this with the Swift preview or the Flash preview, I usually float this and make it really big. There's a little play button here, so it's only doing the master page, but that's the rollover. Oh, oh, I Just turns yellow. Yeah. And technically, they're kind of dying because more people access the internet on a device than a desktop computer, and there's no hover state with your finger. <laughs> like, there's no rollover. So... Some people still put them in for the desktop users because they don't want to um, cripple their environment because of the mobile people, but rollovers may not exist for that much longer. <laughs> All right, so I will dock that down there so I could open and close it. Yes, a lot less work to do. So in pages, um, do you guys know the shortcut you hit to release something from a master page? because it's locked there. It's command shift click or control shift click and I can delete that from the first page in the document. So I'm actually going to switch this to a different color because I'm working on a website for a friend of mine who teaches baseball and I'm going to pop in his assets. So I think I have them on my desktop. Carmona baseball and then I've got his logo. The old ping I'm going to go to Options, Show Import Options, because I did several mock-ups of his logo for him, just experimenting, but I think uh, I that was the one he liked. Sorry. Yeah, just that's right. Control-Shift-Click that. Control, shift, to release an object from the master page, but doesn't delete it from the master page. It doesn't. It stays on the master page. I just locally deleted it on page one, but when I add two, three, or four, it'll come back. And in fact, here's another trick for that. Let me pop this logo in really quickly. But if I do control shift click or command shift click and I change this button to a different color, like this RGB cyan, once I've edited something on the master, if I go to the master page again, and maybe I want the buttons at the middle, top, and bottom, in align, I'll align to the page and I'll center it, yeah, that direction. Do the same with this button. Align. Yes. So both of them are vertically aligned center. And when I go back to page one, even though I changed the color of that, I didn't change the position, so it still obeys the master page, which is really cool. They thought it all the way through. And then if I click here under pages in the panel menu, I can choose remove selected local overrides. Don't remove all the overrides. Don't bring my previous button back, but take the object I selected and set it back to how it's supposed to be on the master. So remove selected local overrides, and then the color went back to yellow instead of that cyan, which is really cool. And that's been there forever. That's not new, um, but not a lot of people know that about InDesign. Yeah. <laughs> To get to the master page items, a lot of people will go here and choose remove or override all. Then it ignores the master forever. If you use the command shift click or control shift click, it's got levels of editability, so it'll still behave. Create a whole new master page. That too, yeah. There's lots of ways to skin that cat, but it's a pain. <laughs> so that's a good one. So with this Carmona baseball, let's pick a background color for it. I'm going to go to the master. And I will unlock the layers of background, and I'll just do a shade of gray.
Good. So just a light gray. And then, oh, <laughs> it's got the number three on it because it was my third version of the mock-up that's there. I don't know if I can crop that out. I may just have to let it go. Yeah, we're going to lose the logo. We will let it go. All right. And then I'll align it to the, yeah, let's do upper left. And then um, if I'm going to be doing web content, instead of interactive for PDF, I could try digital publishing because I'm going to use the new publish online. So in digital publishing, I can actually build animation into this. And with animation, they have presets that are saved. So in this preset, I'm going to choose fly in from top. And it actually does a motion timeline. Well, it will fade in and appear. So I used to teach Flash years ago, and Command Return was the Flash preview. In InDesign, it's Command Shift Return, or Control Shift Enter, that usually triggers the preview. Let's see if that still works. I might have to use the frickin' nuisance key. <laughs> well, never mind. Window interactive with preview yeah command shift return but it might be the enter key so sometimes I have to use that little FN for it I'll just dock this with everything else but if I hit play again there it is fading in I wonder if I have an AI of that oh yeah there we go. I'm going to let it go, just for the sake of time. So now um, I will add some more text. Learn to play baseball and the um, Spanish spelling of that. And then I will double check that and in the language, in the character settings, which usually shows up here, but when your resolution is too low, sometimes you can't get to it, I will change it to Spanish and it should check out okay. No. Interesting. Okay. We're going to let it go because I've been told that's how it's spelled, B-E-I-S-B-O-L. And usually if it's close enough, it will give you alternates. Beatrice is not an alternate. <laughs> but if, I don't know, but if I do hola, that's still Spanish and that's correct. Or if I did nino, it's missing the accent. So if I right click, there it is with the accent. So it's pretty cool in spell checking it. Um, Maybe the E and I are backwards, but maybe it's not in the dictionary. You would think that's a pretty common word. Mm -hmm. But we're going to let it go, and I'll make it bigger. Remember I did earlier command shift period? It's at 12 point, 13, 14, 15. I don't even have to be there. Command shift period, command shift comma, control shift period, control shift comma. And maybe I want it on two separate lines, and I'll go to one of my favorite typefaces, Proxima Nova and make this bigger with command shift period and then I can select all command shift period does the different size lines of type at the same time which is really nice if you're trying to create balance for example and maybe I like that that way and I'll center it and letting option up or down arrow alt up or down arrow and then I'll add a little animation to it so in animation I will go to my selection tool and choose fade in. And then there's a whole timing panel. So when it first starts, Carmona Baseball will load, but this one, let's delay it one second. And so you could set the order, you can have things loop, you can have them go back and forth. Now, sorry, I really, really want that perfect. Let it go, let it go. <laughs> All right, that's better. I'll sleep better tonight. Mm -hmm. Now I'll go to add a page. And I will add some text. And I'm just going to 
cheat and grab the text from page one. Do you ever notice when you page up or page down, it doesn't keep the spread centered in InDesign? Yeah. Do you know you can hold the Option or Alt key down and it keeps it centered? So if you do Option or Alt, page up or page down, it keeps it centered as it navigates. So I'll show you. Here in the Pages panel, I'll create a third page, get timing and character out of my way, and then on the first page, I'll copy this. One on one instruction for kids of all ages. And I'll add an animation. Okay, and I could actually set a duration for this. So I could do maybe three or four seconds. The timing adds it as I create stuff, but it's on a page by page basis. And then I'll go to page three. So here you could see if I hit just page up or page down, it's kind of split. If I fit in window, I'm, on my laptop, I have to use FN and Option page down. That keeps it centered. So it's handy. And then we'll put in an image of a baseball. I thought I had a baseball. There's the baseball. And Show Import Options was on, so that's why that popped up. And I will scale it down. Oh, sugar. Must have. It went in the text frame. And I'm wrapping up. Just no, now. no problem. No worries. <laughs> Thanks. Does anybody want coffee or a espresso? Yeah. Espresso or what was the other? Thing? Espresso. I'm good. Thank you. Iced tea is great for me. Okay, so what I just did here was I clicked on the baseball and I did a bounce. So the baseball is going to bounce in. You could add sound, you could add movies, you could do all kinds of stuff. So I will save this as Carmona. Yeah, so I copied the logo from page one so it'll fly down again. But I started this in upper left and all I did was choose. There's some special effects like bouncing. So bounce right, bounce left. There's all kinds of pulse, spin, swoosh, waves. Um, I could insert sounds as well. I don't know if I have any sounds. I think I have one out there called a click sound. It'd be nice to have a little baseball sound. Yeah. There was an electronic sound I saw for a second. Let's go slower. Oh. Probably should sort by type. Oh, electronic clicks. There we go. It's an MP3. I'll pop the sound in. In media, play on page load. And it's just a little noise. And maybe I'll loop it on that play page. <laughs> and then on this page, I also probably don't want a next page because it's the end of it. So I'll use Command Shift Click. Oops. Don't delete the background, just delete the next page button. So I think I'm ready to export it. So file, export. Many of these effects won't play as a PDF, but we're just going to try an interactive PDF first. So this will be version 01, PDF interactive. Oh, and I can set the view. I can fit the page so it overrides their preferences and I could even open it in full screen mode which is really nice and I could do page transitions if I want let's just do a push transition so it'll apply to every page and when it's done try publish online so we could see how that works and plays in a web browser in the page and everything will work 
and that's under the File menu and Publish Online. That's new to CC 2015, I think. So they snuck that in there. And for compression, I will do 150, so the baseball looks decent and quality high, and I don't need any security, so I will hit Export. It's trying to open in full screen mode. Yes, remember my choice, but you'll notice it didn't play any of the animations. They aren't supported in PDF. There's ways around that, but the rollover works. I can go to next page, that's working. Next page. The sound worked, and it's looping, which is fun. Make it stop, make it stop. <laughs> so we'll get out of there. <laughs> Maybe we'll set the loop to one or two times. Um, so I'm going to cancel here. It was going to go straight to publish online. And sometimes the sound files, it actually went inside the frame. That's why that frame got selected. Sometimes I'll just drag them off in the pasteboard so there's no preview or just have a little piece of it touch the page. Interesting. All right, it's hard to tell with a red frame. There, got that out of there. Got that out of there. Paste. Okay. There, it's touching the edge. In media. Mm. Let's just turn off looping. And then you could set a poster, um, which is the preview image that you see if it's something that's clicked, because you could tie that to a button. Like when they click, it could play a button sound, or when they tap, it could play a button sound. But now I'll do File, Publish Online, Carmona Baseball 01. Allow them to download a PDF, although the PDF would just be informational. It won't have all the animation. And in advanced, oh, you could also keep updating a document because it creates a web link. So maybe there's revisions that happen. So I could create a new one every time, or I could just keep updating it for the end user. And then the resolution will go to high DPI for retina screens or high DPI displays. And I could choose a download PDF settings that I wanted to use. I do a proof setting that's 150 pixels per inch. And we will hit. And you could choose a different image uh, for the thumbnail for the document. So you could navigate to something else. But the first page is fine. So I will publish that. It's uploading. And this will be a live clickable link. So you had an option there to click. Um allow them to print the PDF? It gives them a PDF that they could download and print if they want to. And so if that is unclicked, they can't download it. Right. Right. You can leave it off and it could just be a web page as an example. That's not for every PDF, is it, or just the digital? Just the digital one. Just this publish online. So right here, I can copy this URL or share it on social media. I can view the document, which takes me to that URL. So this is the path for the document. It's served from Adobe servers. There's the first animation coming in. Second animation, go to the next page. And I'll have to double check. That might be something I need to switch for the Flash content for online. But they have their own navigation that's built in there. And there's the baseball bounce, <laughs> which is pretty cool. And then the logo came in, and the sound came in. And what might be nice to add to the end of this, if I close it, is the web link. We just bought his domain, but it's not really a link yet. But I'll draw uh, Carmona. Oh, the Carmona way. And then when I highlight that and copy it, if I go back to my typography workspace, there's hyperlinks. I just paste that in, and as soon as I did, I have no styles in this document, but it built the hyperlink character style. So maybe I want to change that to one of his brand identity colors. So in character color, there's a super secret way to get the colors here if you don't know about it. I can double click this T and add a color with the dialog open. So I'm going to choose CMYK. And I'm going to make it 100 cyan and 100 yellow. I don't think that's it. There's green in there somewhere. The bug with this is I have to click on something else and then back on it, and it'll show up at the bottom of the list. 
it worked in CS4 and CS5. They broke it in CS6, and I've been complaining to them ever since. Please fix this. And I could tell it in the hyperlink, maybe don't underline the hyperlink, because that's kind of old-fashioned looking. So I'll hit OK, and also maybe choose a typeface. I like Proxima Nova, light, hit OK, make it bigger, center align it, pop it at the bottom, align it to the bottom with Command B or Control B, and let's left align it. So hyperlink, ah, it's not a working link. <coughs> but it'll try to go to it. So I will file, publish online, and this time update the existing document. And it knows I have one out there. There's viewers to download the PDF. Hit publish, okay. Even though the link isn't checking out, we bought the domain, but there's nothing on that website yet. But you'll see that it'll try to go to it. But that's nice because it showed the red um, circle to let you know that it wasn't a working link. And then on the master page I'd check those buttons. I may need to switch them from PDF style buttons to flash style buttons or to digital publishing style buttons, which is the EPUB format. EPUB under the hood is really HTML, so I may have to use a different method to create those buttons. Okay, view the document. It should be the same link. So if they shift refresh they should get the same one. Working great. And by the way, this is the download PDF for them. So it's either there or it's not. I hit the next one. This is automatically up. When I try to click it, it does go to the website. Interesting. Right. Yeah, it's blocked. <laughs> it's not an inappropriate website, but it has no content. So that could be why it's blocked. But it did work. The link did try to go somewhere. Now the distortion on the ball. Is that something in the coding? It's a pre-built effect. They actually squish yeah. the item. Okay. Yeah, so they have a lot so of those special things. didn't effects. want that to happen. Oh, yeah. You could actually build your own motion right. path. You could tie things to a path that you draw. So I could extend, like, oh, the back and forward. I could extend this or change the path that it's following. If I come back to the front page, this has a motion path. And I think the direct selection tool it's not letting me zoom far enough out, so let me try putting that at the bottom and using the direct selection tool. And I could extend that so it'll play longer or come in at a different rate. So if I go to the Swift preview, window interactive, Swift preview. There. <laughs> it shot down longer, so I might want to extend the time, but you could do all kinds of stuff with the paths. Um, a very good friend of mine wrote an excellent book for all the stuff that I've shown. I'm not trying to promote it, but it's a good book. <laughs> it's called Interactive Dash InDesign. On her first round, I did the tech editing for it. I think it's available on Amazon too. It is. So Interactive InDesign CC by Mira Rubin. And it has everything and more. Creating forms, unlocking the form fields, even doing EPUB, doing all the buttons, everything in there. So if you, we don't really have any curriculum anywhere I teach that has this stuff. So whenever somebody asks me to do a day of this, this is what I buy for the curriculum. Any questions? Yeah, for when yeah. you publish online, can you set it up so you FTP to your own website as opposed to go to Adobe or? No, right now it only goes to Adobe's website. Can you publish it for online to a folder and then you just upload it yourself? They don't offer any of those. Right now it's just to Adobe services, but you could probably use a web service to pull that content. But they have their own viewer and everything that's part of the interface. So if you were, so if you were to create this for your client here and they want it on their website, They'd have to create a custom URL. It's not really for website building. It's really just to push content out there that's a little bit more interactive and to give clients proofs without having to email stuff back and forth.
So it's new. It's a pilot piece. They aren't really trying to replace Dreamweaver or Adobe Muse. They're just giving you other ways to put content out there. So you could use Bitly or something like that or TinyURL to create your own custom URL. There are some web services that will grab entire websites. So then you could just edit the code and put it back out there. And the other thing you could do is the way to get it to a folder is save it as EPUB. You take that EPUB, you rename it .zip. Once you rename it .zip and you open it in a zip opening program, it has all the HTML in it. So there's still a way to get there. You could do it as an EPUB, but it's kind of a hack. But so you replace EPUB with... Yeah. And I think I can show that really quickly. There's some... Um, Basically, they name it EPUB for e-reading devices like the Kindle Reader or the Barnes & Noble Nook and that sort of stuff. But if I come back to InDesign and I do File, Export, Format, EPUB, Reflowable, so this would be scalable, save it, and they even let you publish it online through this as well. Let's go with the newer EPUB 3. I don't know that I need to change. There's even cascading style sheets. It'll build for you, like out of hyperlinks that you can edit. And I could add myself as the creator. <coughs> but when I hit OK, uh, take my keystrokes off. Okay, good. It doesn't look right because you have to do anchored inline graphics to do EPUB content. Um, so this is using iBooks, Apple's built-in EPUB viewer. So we're not going to see a lot here, but if I go to that EPUB and I will copy it and change the .epub to .zip, Use zip. On the Mac, you need a special zip editing application, and I have better zip. You can't just double click it and get to the contents, but inside there is the XHTML. That's the code. So there are ways to get to it and ways to accomplish what we've done. So basically, you're building HTML5 animations with CSS and that sort of stuff. It's not as easy <laughs> as just doing export or just packaging to a folder, but there's a way to get there. So I could edit all this content inside. You could see the generated styles. I don't know what application that I'll open with. Dreamweaver, that makes sense. But I think we're past our time. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to thank Laura for having me today. Let thank us know you. what topics you guys would be interested in. And uh, good luck with InDesign. And I will stop the recording.